Shut up and sit down. Okay. Next up, we have Mark Miller, N5RFX. The title of his talk is 2 meter and 70 centimeter digital radio modulation basics. So that's the title I picked. Um, actually, what this, is, this presentation is about is a journey that uh, a club that I belong to in Arlington, Texas took in getting into digital uh, voice communications. So part of that was understanding what kind of radios we could use, uh, how we could uh, go ahead and set up um, a digital radio system. So we began this journey back in uh, 2013 when D-Star was, uh, was pretty popular in our area. But what was happening was that a lot of the people really weren't um, getting the experience or weren't able to experiment. Uh, they were afraid of messing something up. So uh, we have a group that meets every Saturday morning. There is about 10 or 12 of us. It kind of depends. Uh, and we're all neighbors. So we're within 10 to 12 miles of each other. And we decided, hey, why don't we set up one of these uh, DMR uh, repeaters? Well, we didn't really want to go to ICOM and spend thousands of dollars on a, on a DMR repeater. So we said, well, let's, let's see if we can make one ourselves. So we. Um, we decided to do that, and I'm going to take you through the journey of the, of the things that we had to do and how we set it up. What we ended up with was a DMR D-Star Fusion P25 NXDN repeater. I can tell you uh, what happened as we did that and, and why, we why we went back to a single uh, modulation type, but this was a good experiment. In fact, I had this repeater at Dayton one year to, uh, doing a demonstration on, on this very thing right here. So Arlington, Texas, oil rich Texas, as uh, Bob likes to, to put it. Uh, and oh, by the way, my day job, I sell net meters. That's my, that's my job. So Bob, thank you very much for that advertisement. All right, so the first thing that we had to do was uh, to get a club call sign. Pretty easy. Um, we just went to the um, uh, URL here and looked to see how to do it. So we were a club, but we didn't have really a president, we didn't have any bylaws or anything, so we, we learned how to do that. So we set all that up, we became an official club, and we called ourselves the Arlington Breakfast Club. Okay, so when we got the call sign then from uh, the FCC, uh, which our first one was uh, KF5UGN, then we had to register a repeater. So first of all, we had to figure out well, what type did we want? Well, that was pretty easy back in 2013 because really you had P25 and you had um, D-Star. Well, P25, the radios were pretty expensive. Repeaters were pretty expensive. Not a lot you could do with them. So we decided to go uh, with D-Star. And we set up uh, the D-Star repeater using MMDVM. Some of you are probably familiar with that because MMDVM is what all the hotspots use. It's the same, uh, same software, same setup. In fact, the only thing you have to do between a hotspot and this repeater is actually tell it it's a repeater. And that's mainly so it knows that it's full duplex. All right, so we had to get a, a, um, a D-Star ID. Today, that's, that's kind of combined with DMR. That's what this list is showing here. So if I was getting a DMR uh, ID, I would go through this, this list. This is a website that you go to and you fill out the, uh, the information and you register your digital repeater. And then Brandmeister, that's the one that we chose for DMR later on. Brandmeister, they are not very strict on how things are done. That's what we wanted. We wanted something we could, we could experiment with. We didn't want anybody coming down on us and saying, no, no, you can't do that. You're ruining my drive time and all that. We, in fact, we like Brandmeister so much, and this is, this is kind of moving on to DMR, because TAC32, those of you that are in, know DMR, TAC-32 was like operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that fulfilled another purpose that we had uh, for the repeater, which was doing drive testing and understanding uh, the coverage that we had. So Brandmeister, when you get to the DMR side, you just go in and um, you pick a, uh, actually, a server here. So this is the one I chose. You can see, obviously, why I did that. And that's the, uh, the server that my repeater actually connects to there. So there's the homebrew way, 
And then there's the buy a box way. So this is, I think, probably one of the nicest repeaters. If you want something that works, not too hard to set up, you can plug in and go. There's actually two models. This is the XPR 8300 and 8400. The 8300 is the previous version. It's not made. In fact, I'm not even sure if the 8400 is made anymore, but they're readily available. You can get them uh, at Dayton. I see them all the time at the flea market. I see them on eBay, uh, QRZ every once in a while. Uh, QTH, you'll see, you see these uh, show up. So this is a standalone repeater, and really all you have to do is plug it in, plug in your uh, CPS, your, your programming software, and take off. There's two ranges. If you, get, if you get one of these, just pay attention to the frequency ranges of the repeater. There's UHF-1 and UHF-2. Motorola was always famous for this and having They'll say that it goes from 403 to 512, but in reality, the radios really are, are narrower than that. All right, so if you happen to get a UHF-1, you're good to go on the ham bands. If you get a UHF-2, that's a little higher than a ham band. It starts at, uh, at 450, but there's a procedure that'll let you do a little hacking, a little um, hex hacking in the uh, uh, CPS right, and, and change the code plug so that you can operate in our, our band here down, at, uh, you know, down in the 440 range. So this is an eye chart here. I don't expect you to memorize this or anything like that. This is something that if you're interested, I can, I can give you a copy of this. Uh, this also is on Repeater Builder. If you're familiar with Repeater Builder, they've got a lot of good information on, uh, on setting up these type of repeaters. Um, the only advantage I have or I see between UHF-1 and UHF-2 UHF-1, the lowest power I can go to is like 20 watts. UHF-2, I can go down to one watt. So I was happy that I ended up with a UHF-2 repeater because I can set my repeater uh, down to 10 watts. And the reason I, I like that is because in Texas, we have uh, a band of frequencies in, in um, 70 centimeters that are called backyard repeater frequencies. And so your um, commitment is, you don't have to get it coordinated or anything. You've got to work with the people that are on it. But the idea is to use low antennas, like 40 feet, don't go much higher than 40 feet, and keep your power down. So my power coming out of this repeater is uh, 10 watts coming out of the duplexer. And all I'm trying to do is cover an area where my guys that I eat breakfast with on Saturday morning, we can communicate with handhelds. Uh, with mobiles, we can communicate all over the Dallas-Fort Worth area. The, Coverage is kind of amazing. In fact, I'm a little worried sometimes that we're overlapping each other, and I want to turn it down. Now, you can get all, there's all kinds of information on the web about how to set up the Motorola repeater. Uh, they're pretty much, all the repeaters are pretty much the same, but uh, you set up a link type, you have a UDP port, oops, sorry, UDP port, and so forth. This is all information uh, that you can find on Brandmeister. You can also find it on um, DMR Mark. That's D-M-R-M-A-R-C. I haven't been promoting them a lot, but they, they have the same information. So let's let you know how to set it up. And the channel, I only have one channel on mine. And then we wanted something that we could uh, operate when there was no power. So the, this Motorola repeater has built-in battery backup. You just supply, uh, it really wants a, um, a lead-acid battery, so like a uh, AGM, that would be perfect for it. I haven't tried a lithium on it. I don't know if it has the charging circuit for a lithium. I'm not sure exactly what it would do to one of those. But we, we, uh, we put an AGM battery on it, and that's our, that's our battery backup. So then the controller that we use is uh, MMDVM. So it runs on a um, um, Raspberry Pi, and then there's a board, an interface board, that interfaces the Raspberry Pi to the audio input or the baseband input of the repeater. Now we can do this with the motor roller repeater, or you now can go out and start rolling your own a little bit and find some mobile radios that'll, that'll work this way. So we, if you look down here at the bottom, 
we really have found two Motorola radios that work the best. Let me just tell you, the only reason I picked Motorola radios, I worked for them for 10 years. I know how they operate. There's other radios that'll work fine, like this. Um, I, I've used some ICOM radios like um, the 208H. Anything really that has that DIN connector on the back that you used to use for a 9600 baud packet will work fine. I haven't found one yet that, that won't work uh, that way. Okay, so the MMDVM repeater is our, uh, our controller, and the type of interface that I used was the STM32DVM. And that's because repeater builder sold it, and I trust what they, uh, what they sell, so uh, these other ones are fine too. I've heard good, good information about those, but this is the one I chose. And then the radio that we started off with with D-Star was actually a Max Track 300. So on the Max Track uh, radios, you have to kind of be careful when you go out and buy one, there's 16 pin, or actually 15 pin uh, connectors on the back, and then there's the ones that are, I think, five. Either one will work. If you do a little surgery on the five pin, you can make it work. The easiest one, though, is to use the, the 15 pin. And that, again, on Repeater Builder, you can get that information also. All right, uh, so for that, the radio that we chose, this one here, the CDM1550, that was for D DMR. All right. And so we did a little testing on that. Standby current was 1 amp, and then uh, transmit, depending on how much power we wanted to put out, this is our, our, our current that we're running. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, we actually run 10 watts, typically, so about 3.8 amps is all we draw out of that radio. Now this is the CDM series connector. This is similar to the MaxTrack connector. So without going over all these pins, the ones that you're mainly concerned with, you're concerned about pin five, which is flat transmit audio. You don't want any pre-emphasis. Same, same rules you used to use for 9600 baud packet, you use for this. So flat transmit audio, and then down here, if I go down here at the bottom, there should be a flat filtered receive audio, this pin here. So this is your input, this is your output that goes to your Raspberry Pi interface, radio interface. A little more information on that, um, how, what, other, what other pins you can use, uh, input, output, and then MMDVM settings right here. So sometimes you have to invert the receive audio, sometimes you don't, and again, and same thing with transmit. So it gives you some indications there. Now adjusting deviation, um, when we first started with D-Star, the way I actually got the deviation adjusted on the radio is I drove down to downtown Dallas, got near the, the big D-Star repeater down there, and I uh, took my service monitor and let it, be, let it receive that uh, transmission, and I just kind of looked to see how much uh, audio waveform I was getting on the, on the scope. And I said, boom, there we go. So I just duplicated that at the house, right, at, at, our, at our location, duplicated that. Well, I saw another way of doing it later on. It's kind of a, a way that we've been taught years ago, and I just had forgotten how to do it. It's using bezel functions. So what they have you do, and I had to make some notes here on this pad because it's, it's hard to remember all this. Um, so the deviation for DMR, let's say, is 2.75 kilohertz. So if you use a 1200 hertz tone, and you, then that's what's, that's what's happening here. I've ejected a 1200 hertz tone, and you can see I've got a bezel null here. That's the best I could do. So that means you're around 2.88 kilohertz. So all I have to do then is measure the audio and then adjust that audio, that baseband signal, another 5%, and I should be at 2.7, uh, yeah, 2.75 kilohertz. Great way to do it. And you're saying, well, you know, it takes a spectrum analyzer. Well, maybe your club will buy one. These are getting cheap. This is a Regal. I bought this at Dayton uh, three or four years ago. Best thing I ever bought. I love this thing. And there's the 5% after adjusting at 5%. So you can see the, the null went up. And then just to do a sanity check, I went ahead and uh, measured the occupied bandwidth. So the occupied bandwidth should be listed here, something like 9 kilohertz. Let's see. Yeah, 8.9 kilohertz. Just to make sure that I, you know, I adjusted properly and I wasn't occupying too much of the channel. 
The receive audio adjustment's even easier. You just take the audio out of the receiver. There's a, either an LED or there's a test point that you can go to. kind of depends on your interface. And you just adjust the audio until you reach either a certain voltage level or you wait until that LED kind of blinks at you. Pretty nice, pretty easy to go. So that's what is being described here. Then the, on the MMDVM repeater, you use the dashboard to set up the network, the RF. Um, uh, DMR is uh, what, what we're using on this one, although this one does do all, all the different modes. It does every mode uh, that's really available now for us. So if you're going to pick out um, a radio to use and you're not 100% sure whether it will work or not, it doesn't have that DIN connector on it, it's not a, a Motorola Max Track or a CDM 1500, what you can look at is the actual schematics. Open up the service manual or open up the manual. And believe it or not, a lot of these radios still have uh, schematics and block diagrams and everything. Uh, this, is a, this is a CS800. If you've uh, used one of those before, that's a DMR mobile radio. It's not an 800D, but it's a, an 800. Shows the block diagram. So what you're looking for, you're, the most important thing, is on your transmit audio path, if you're going to use a synthesized radio, you've got to have two paths for the audio. So that's what we're showing here. Mod 1, and then um, Mod 2 will come over to the uh, PLL. Yeah, right here. All right, so the reason for this, back when we just had, we used crystal radios, we could take the baseband signal, run it right to the crystal, the frequency determining device, and uh, actually to a varactor, right, and make the varactor swing, make the crystal swing in frequency, and that would give us our, our deviation and our FM type signal. Well, when we went to synthesized radios, that we have one problem with that. Uh, digital signals have a low frequency component, and synthesizers, they're designed to pull the frequency back to center again. So if we don't do something to maybe trick the, the transmit side that, uh, you know, we're going to use this low frequency signal and we, wanna, we don't want it to steer back to the center every time, then we use what Motorola calls two-spot modulation. So this is your main audio here going to the VCO, and then you have mod two, which is the low frequency component. There'll be a, uh, a filter, a low-pass filter. Where this was kind of, if we go back in time, where this was first used was back, uh, and I'm sure all the, all the, uh, the manufacturers did this, but uh, I can speak for Motorola. They use DCS or digital coded squelch, which is um, digital, D, digital PL, a very low frequency digital signal. And that's where they first developed this two spot modulation. So your main audio, which was your voice audio, would come in and you know, modulate the VCO directly. This is a direct modulation. It's, there's not reactive modulation like a lot of radios have right after the VCO. This directly modulates the VCO. They took the low frequency component, ran it into this, um, uh, the TCXO, which is the reference frequency for the synthesizer. So it's now swinging right along with part of this. So you're faking out the synthesizer, making it think because you're swinging this, uh, um, whoa. Talk about freaking out. I'm freaking out. Ah, back. Okay. Um, so that's, that's one of the things you can look for in a radio. You can look at the block diagram and see if it has this dual spot modulation. The patents run out on that, so this, this, is, a, this is not a Motorola radio here. This is the, CS, the Connect System CS800. It might as well be a Motorola radio because the first time I looked at the schematic, I thought I was looking at one. But a lot, like I say, a lot of those patents have expired. So on the schematic side, if you just want to make sure, this is the CS800. So this is my frequency, my VCO frequency uh, determining device here. Man, I'll tell you what, not having much luck here. There we go. I got two bigger fingers, I guess. All right. And then you have, um, so what, what you have here is your mod coming in and coming up here, and it's... Uh, changing the, um, the capacitance of the reactor, which changes, of course, the uh, oscillator frequency. 
And then on the reference side, you've got mod 2 that comes in here through this amp, comes up, and goes into the magical X3, which is the 16.8 uh, megahertz reference frequency for the radio. So going back, this is the main modulation here. Okay, so you can see that's, that's present. And they do a pretty good job in this manual explaining how uh, all this works. And then here's your reference being modulated here. So this radio would be a good candidate for a DMR radio. And that's good because it is a DMR radio. That's exactly how they sell this radio. And then I have to go back to the venerable uh, MaxTrack 300. Nice little cheap radio that does all the digital modes. Um, so here, nicely labeled, here's the reference oscillator. Here are the reactors. And this says comes from R164 wiper. That's the uh, low frequency. That's the dual spot adjustment. That's what adjusts the low frequency part. There'll be a low pass filter down here somewhere on the floor and feeding the audio, the low frequency audio here to the reactors. And then here's your main VCO. And let's see if we can find it here. Yeah, here it is, coming in down this line right here and feeding this reactor. So this radio obviously is gonna work okay if Mark would keep, stop uh, hitting this. Uh, this radio is going to work fine because we've got dual spot modulation. I'm, I'm feeding the reference oscillator with a low frequency component of the digital signal, and I'm feeding the baseband audio, or the, the non-low frequency part, the higher frequency part here. So these, these two, two radios are good candidates, and other radios that opera, operate like this would also uh, be good candidates. Okay, so were there any questions? or any? Yes. Yeah, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. So in this case here, my perspective, yeah, go ahead. Let, so that. Uh, so when you say you're feeding the, when you say you're feeding the baseband audio, you mean you're feeding the digital yes. version of the baseband audio. I wasn't clear on that. <laughs> so in my perspective here on, on the radio, all I have is a digital signal. So I have a ba either a baseband signal or I have an IF signal or an IQ signal if I'm using an SDR type radio. So yes, it is the, the base, I don't know how else to say it. I've been so trained on that baseband. But it's not, it's not this kind of audio, it's digital audio. Right, it's not the analog, it's the digital. Right, that's right. It's a digital version of yes. analog audio. Right, right. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, Phil. I'm in trouble. Yeah, you mentioned SDR type radios. Uh, with those, you have no problem with the low and high frequencies. Right. It's only just an artifact the way synthesized radios work. Right. right. Yep. Okay. Going once, going twice. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome.